Prodigy. Well, obviously, we are so very pleased with Charlie's progress. A perfectly chilled bottle of Chardonnay was tilted and crisply fragrant wine poured into an expensive crystal glass. Harrison smiled and raised the receptacle to his lips before sipping slowly. He had to admit it was a very fine flavour and made the prolonged torture of his host waffling somewhat more bearable. So what can he do these days? He volunteered the question in the pretense that he was genuinely interested. In truth, he would much rather have been out on the golf course, enjoying the sun on his face and the adoring looks of the rather cute caddy that had recently started carrying his clubs. Oh, all sorts of things, Charlie's mother chirped him brightly. Harrison groaned inwardly. Oh, this was all he needed. The blonde vacuum had been switched on. How Clark could live with such a ditz was completely beyond him. He may be internally dull, but had an incredibly incisive brain. Perhaps it was just the sex. Anyway, now she had started to witter her on, there would be no stopping her. He took a larger sip of the finely fragranced wine and braced himself. There's all the clever stuff with the letters, isn't there, Ronnie? Algebra, dear. Oh, yes, that's right, algebra, she giggled, scooping a few pretzels out of a lacquered fair trade bowl from Borneo. I mean, who would have thought? Sons using letters? What would be next? Stories written in numbers? <laughs> a childish giggle seared into Harrison's brain like a stun gun into an unlucky future pork chop. He surreptitiously glanced at his watch. Christ, it was only three. He took a mental breath. Algebra. Really? Fascinating. And um, how old is the little man now? He's not five until September, Clark said. He'll be one of the oldest children in his year group. I guess that will give him a bit of an advantage. Five, Harrison spluttered. He's not even started school yet. You've got him solving algebraic equations? Clark shook his head. Oh, the basic stuff he got very quickly. He's on to quadratic formula. I'm measuring the gradients and tangents now. The base of Harrison's empty glass wrapped against the occasional table as he lowered it down. Are you serious? Is that A-level stuff for teenagers? Ronnie says it's a matter of just learning the methods. Charlie's mother beamed. I think it's all very clever. I struggle to remember the method for making bread rolls. I bet you forget the method to breathe if you're distracted by a Gucci handbag. Harrison mused inwardly. Outwardly, he said, shouldn't he be more into running around with a cardboard box on his head at his age. I know my two were. They spent six months talking to each other in duck speak. The constant quacking drove me quite mad. He's never really been into all that infantile stuff, Clark explained. He was such a fast learner when it came to reading. He was always asking about numbers. That's why we got him the nanny. She's been a great help. Oh, she's very good, Charlie's mum exclaimed in deeply serious manner. She's from Hungary. Bulgaria, dear, Clark corrected patiently. She's from Bulgaria. Another stumbled lacerated Harrison's brain as the blonde laughed at her own obvious stupidity. Oh, silly me, I always get it wrong, but yes, yeah, she's very good. So efficient. I suppose they have to be over there. What with them being communists and all? Clark appeared somewhat uncomfortable as he shifted in his armchair. Darling, he placed his hand on hers. We've already had this conversation. They're not communists anymore. They're normal people, just like you and me. Heaven help the Hungarians, thought Harrison. The pen glided fluidly over the paper. Letters danced with numbers and symbols that were completely alien to Hayley Clark. She accepted that she had never been one of the high flyers at school. But she appreciated beauty when she saw it, the fine cut of a Versace dress, the high polish of a pair of Dolce and Gabbana heels, and the mathematical genius of a four-year-old son. Careful so as not to crease her white pristine dress, she knelt on the floor next to where Charlie was writing in his exercise book. To distant onlooker, he would look like any other preschooler, doodling and drawing book. But in reality, <clears throat> in reality, what was it her son was doing? There were brackets, letters, large numbers, small numbers, and all manner of symbols which looked like they belonged on a coat worn by Harry Potter, rather than coming from the mind of a child. Hayley smiled and fussed her son's hair. It did not even blink. He just carried on writing. The muffled sound of a foot on thick carpet caught her attention. She turned to face the young woman who had entered the room. Oh, hello, Anna, 
Hedy motioned to the large tumbler in the nanny's hand. Is it lunchtime already? Yes, Mrs. Clark. Charlie? The young boy looked up immediately. Time for your shake. Quietly and with no protest, the young boy left his work and headed over to the broad oak dining table where he sat and waited patiently as his nanny placed a tumbler on a coaster. Drink it all up now, the young woman instructed. Charlie did as he was asked, silently gulping the thick drink down until the glass was empty and he was sporting a white moustache that he absentmindedly removed with the back of his hand. Afterwards, he slid off his chair and returned to his work. Anna? Yes, Mrs. Clark? Can I ask what is actually in the shakes you give Charlie? Good things, the nanny replied, as she carried the empty tumbler through to the kitchen. Things to make him learn well. <clears throat> Darling, Ronald Clark mumbled a vague response from his side of the bed. Do you think Charlie is happy? The grey-haired professor turned wearily onto his back. <laughs> it had been a long day. Too many meetings and other things. He flinched at the memory and his hand absent-mindedly rubbed his cheek. Why shouldn't he be? I don't know. It's just that when Mark came over the other day, I, I got the feeling he didn't approve, you know. Clark sighed. I can't say that I do. His wife continued on with a train of thought regardless. And he's so quiet. Who? Mark Harrison? No, Charlie. All he does is write out those sums in his book all day long. And I know it's all very clever and that, but is it normal? Well, we know he's not normal by society's standards. He's a genius. We should be proud of that. Clark turned back to his soft pillow. It truly had been a long day. He wanted to go to sleep and forget all about it. His wife apparently had other ideas. And then there's all that stuff that Anna feeds him. You mean the shakes? Clark groaned into his pillow. We've been over this before, darling. Yes, yes, I know, Hayley Flat. They're, they're full of amiga things to help his brain do what it needs to do. I, I know all that, but surely it wouldn't help to give him something else for a change. Such as? Oh, I don't know. She tapped a manicured finger against her perfect lips. Something fun. Something like a jam sandwich, perhaps. So you want to fill him full of junk? No. Right then, but those shakes, what's in them? I told you. Yes, I know, but what ingredients exactly? Ronald Clark realised that he did not really know. I told you, Mr Clark, things to help him learn. Yes, I know that, Anna, but what exactly? The dark-haired nanny eyed her employer suspiciously. You've never cared before. Why do you care now? It's... Clark squirred. My wife that wants to know. The nanny raised an eyebrow. Oh, so today you care about what she thinks, do you? Hmm. Acid dripped from her tongue. Yesterday it was, she means nothing to me, and marrying her was a mistake. I think you need to decide what it is that you want from your life. She crossed her arms accusingly across a small bust. Clark flinched as he expected another slap, but none came. Oh, this was too much to endure. This obviously isn't working, he muttered. I think we'll have to terminate your employment. I will pay you a month's wages, but you have to be out of the house by the weekend. He turned and scurried out of the room, his lover's eyes burning hatred into his back. Haley slipped from the hot, sipped from the hot cappuccino as she watched Charlie at the table. Gone were the mass books. Gone with long numbers and funny-looking symbols. Instead, he had a large colouring book out in front of him, and he was doodling with a pack of pencil crayons. From a spot on the sofa, it looked like he was drawing a man of some sort. It was bright red with its arms out to its sides. Perhaps it was a cartoon character, a superhero of some type. That would explain the bright, vibrant scarlet. Whatever it was, it was better than algebra. Anna walked quietly into the room. Mrs Clark? The mother nodded at the nanny. In her hand, the brunette was holding a tumbler that was full to the brim with a bright red shake. Well, at least it looked unhealthy. That was a start, at least. Besides, the woman would be gone from the house in a few days, and Hedy could start being a proper mother again, spoiling and pampering her little man. She looked on as Anna gave the drink to Charlie, and he glugged it down voraciously. Wow, that must be really tasty. What's in it? The nanny removed the empty tumbler and gently ran her fingers through the young boy's hair. Something to make him happy, she said. Something to make him happy. 
Haley woke with a start. She'd been dreaming. It was such a sweet dream, too. Ronnie and she had been walking along a deserted beach with Charlie. The three of them had been hand in hand and smiling contentedly. She'd been wearing a long, white, flowing dress and her feet had felt warm in the sand. The sea had been shushing against the shore and dolphins had been diving in and out of the surf. An idyllic paradise. Then there had been lightning and thunder. A massive clap had shot out of the air and she'd woken in panic. Her heart pounded as she sat bolt upright in bed. Her eyes wide open and her hair plastered to her scalp. The light was on. Why was the light on? Ronnie was stirring next to her as she turned and saw that they were not alone. Charlie was stood at the foot of the bed in his nightwear. Sweetie, she asked. What's the matter? The son stood silent in his brown check pyjamas, his eyes off in some middle distance. He's sleepwalking. Ronald grumbled, slipping his glasses on and peering over the tops of them as he always did. God knows why. Hayes slipped out of the bed and went over to her son. Gently she slipped her arm around his shoulders. Come on, sweetie, let's get you back to bed. Silently, Charlie did as he was told and followed his mother back to his bedroom. Heavy gave him a, sm gave a small gasp when she opened the door. There are drawings everywhere. Reams and reams of sketches and doodles. All of them pictures of people or parts of people in vibrant red crayon. She stooped down and picked one up and wished she hadn't. It was inside of someone's head. The muscle, tissue and fibre. Oh, Charlie, she cried. No wonder you were having nightmares. Carefully, she slid him to his bed, lifted him up and tucked him in. When she was sure that he was soundly asleep, she scooped up all the sketches and marched back to her bedroom. Ronnie, have you seen these? Haley demanded, thrusting the pictures under her husband's nose. What the hell is going on? Clark leafed through the images and shrugged. Oh, sorry, I was a thing about anatomy. What's the problem? All Haley could do was stare at her husband, dumbfounded. At least it's not maths, Clark grumbled, and dropping the pictures to the floor, settled back down to sleep. Haley lay awake, listening to the every noise in the house. There was a scratching of the tree against the window, the creaking of the bed as her husband shifted in his sleep, the ticking of the bedside clock. The list was endless. It was an unwelcome symphony of music being played with extreme vigour by an unseen orchestra, intent on keeping her from asleep. She tried burying her head in a pillow. She tried going to sleep, her arms crossed over her ears. Nothing worked, so she just lay there and listened. Listened to the scratch. The creep, the tick, scratch, creep, tick, scratch, creep, tick, scratch, creep, thud, tick. Hayley held a breath and listened again. There had been another noise, a, a rogue instrument in the nocturnal orchestration. She peered over at Ronald. He was sound asleep and she was sure that he would be none too pleased if she woke him again. It was much stealth as she could manage. She swung her legs out of the warm bed and made her way to the door. Cautiously, she peered down the landing. Nothing moved in the shadows. There came another thud. It was downstairs. Hedy glanced back nervously into the bedroom. She could wait, Ronald. She could ring the police. She could do any number of things, but she would be overreacting. Instead, she cautiously made her way along the dark landing. Her hand hovered momentarily over the light switch, then drew back. What if it was an intruder? A light would draw them to her. She edged down in the stairs in the darkness. At first everything seemed as if she had left it when she got to bed. The front door was closed and the curtains were drawn. Nothing out of the norm. The living room door, however, was open. Had she shut it? Perhaps she'd left it open. Hedy couldn't remember. She crept away from the bottom stair and padded over to the door on her bare feet. A short nighty brushing against her thighs. Suddenly she felt cold and exposed. A shiver ran down her spine. As she carefully made her way into the living room, she became aware of the notion that she was not alone. There was a light noise from behind the sofa. Her heart rising up in her throat, she crept as stealthily as she could towards the sofa, the thick pile of the carpet pressing up between her bare toes. The woman held her breath tighter than she'd ever held a handbag on a crowded bus and her heart felt like it was going to pound out of her chest. Every instinct was telling her to turn and flee, but she knew she had to know what was down here, what was hiding. Slowly, tentatively, the thick pile masking the sound of her hesitant footsteps, Hedy ventured round to the rear of the sofa, her eyes starting to become accustomed to the gloom. 
and the varying depths of the shadows. The tension she felt knotting up inside her was unbearable, as if she had been trussed up in an overtight corset, unable to free herself. One hand steadying herself on the top of the sofa, she peered around its back. There was nothing there. Absolutely nothing. <sighs> Haley let out an immense groan and breathed in sweet relief as she sank back against the finely upholstered piece of furniture. It was okay. Everything was okay. It had just been an imagination. She shrieked in pain as something sharp dug into her ankle. She looked down. She saw a knife sticking out from under the sofa, clutched in a small hand. Hedy turned to run, but her foot could not move properly. As she twisted and fell, she could only watch in disbelief as a small son crawled out from between the legs of the sofa. Anna flicked on the lights and let a feeling of satisfaction draw a smile to her lips. Charlie was sat slumped over a stack of drawings that lay strewn around the dining table. The nanny tiptoed over and slowly stroked his hair as she carefully leafed through the perfectly articulated sketches of human anatomy. A finger traced the ventricles of a heart, the workings of a lower intestine, and the musculature of dissected torsos, male and female. She nodded with approval. He had been most meticulous. There was not a drop of blood on any of the drawings. The same could not be said for the rest of the house. Carefully, lovingly, she scooped the young genius up into her arms and carried him out to her waiting car.